Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neera Shaw, the director of the State of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew, <clears throat> Commissioner of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are able to join everyone today to provide an update on where we stand with respect to COVID-19 across the state of Maine for, <clears throat> excuse me, for today, <clears throat> November 30th, 2020. And I begin today's update on a sad note. The Maine CDC has received reports of three additional individuals who have passed away with COVID-19. All three were women in their 80s, one from Somerset County and two from Penobscot County. Their passings mark the 192nd, 193rd, and 194th deaths associated with COVID-19 across the state of Maine since we began our work. We'd like to take a second to wish, <clears throat> excuse me, to wish their friends, family members, and their communities our deepest condolences during this time of their grief. Right now in Maine, we are aware of 11,757 total cases of COVID-19, <clears throat> an increase of 249 cases just th since yesterday alone. Of those, 10,487 are confirmed cases and 1,270 are probable cases. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've experienced 194 deaths associated with COVID-19 and cumulatively 699 individuals have been hospitalized. <clears throat> Just in the past 30 days alone, 191 individuals have been hospitalized. And right now in Maine, 139 individuals are currently in the hospital. Of those 139, 48 are in the intensive care unit and 22 are on ventilators. That's an increase of four people who are on ventilators just since yesterday alone. <clears throat> Statewide right now, there are approximately 99 ICU beds <clears throat> that are available for use. Of yesterday's cases, 26% of all of the cases reported <clears throat> were among individuals from Androscoggin County, and 23% of the cases were from folks in Cumberland County, and 21% <clears throat> were from individuals in York County. <laughs> My apologies, everyone. I took a sip of Diet Coke right before I went on, and I think a little bit of it, a little bit of it is still stuck in my throat. I'm feeling fine today. <clears throat> no cause for concern. It's just a little bit of something stuck in my throat. Among all of our cases, 1,617 are among healthcare workers. <clears throat> I'd like to take a second now to provide an update on where we stand with respect to outbreaks. I'd like to list off just the outbreak investigations that Maine CDC has opened since Friday. <clears throat> since Friday, we have opened investigations at Perry Transport Paving in Poland, where we are aware of five individual employees. <clears throat> We've also opened an investigation at the Long Creek Youth Development Center, where we are aware of six cases among employees. At Penobscot Community Health, where we are aware of three cases. At Auburn Public Works, where we are aware of seven cases. <clears throat> At the Dexter EMS Station, where we are aware of eight cases to date. At Granite Bay Care in Saco, where we are aware of three cases. At the Nokomis Regional High School in Newport, six cases. At Viking Lumber, three cases and at Westbrook High School, three cases. <clears throat> I'd like next to turn to provide an update on an outbreak in which Maine CDC, as well as our colleagues from a number of other agencies were involved with over the past several days. And that's an outbreak at the Island Nursing Home. <clears throat> right now, we are aware of 44 total cases of COVID-19 associated with this facility. 25 of those cases are amongst residential care residents, and 10 
are amongst cases, amongst individuals on the nursing side. In addition to that, we are also aware of nine staff members who have tested positive, again, bringing that total to 44. <clears throat> Over the past several days, we have been in regular communication with the administrator of Iowa Nursing Home, Mr. Matthew Trombley. We have continued to work very closely and very collaboratively, collaboratively with him to address all the various challenges that have been posed by this outbreak. On a personal note, I have to say I've been very impressed with Mr. Trombley's response to this very challenging situation amidst very challenging times. We are aware that they have needed assistance with respect to things like staffing, as well as support on PPE, as well as testing. And we've been able to work very collaboratively with Mr. Trombley and his entire team to make sure that they've got everything that they need to continue doing the best things they can to keep residents and staff at Iowa Nursing Home safe. <clears throat> I'd like to turn now to provide an update on where we are with respect to various testing methods. Our seven day PCR positivity rate has sadly continued to climb. It now stands at 3.9%. Nationally, on a seven day basis, the national positivity rate is at 9.6%. However, just in Maine, <clears throat> one week ago, our positivity rate stood <clears throat> at 2.6%. At and today, just over the past seven days, it's risen to 3.9%. We have also in the past 10 or 12 days started to receive steady and sustained reports of antigen testing that has also been done in Maine. And so we are now able to calculate and report an antigen positivity rate. <clears throat> Again, the number that I just mentioned a moment ago, 3.9% is for PCR tests. But there are different types of tests, <clears throat> all of which can characterize active infection. Antigen testing is another one of those modalities. And again, we've now received enough steady reports of antigen tests to be able to calculate a positivity rate there. And that number in Maine right now stands at 2.99%. <clears throat> the third metric that we keep tabs on is testing volume. Right now in Maine, testing volume for PCR tests only stands at 547 for every 100,000 individuals. I just wanna take a second to put some of those numbers in perspective. Just in the past seven days, Maine CDC has received an average of 369 positive COVID-19 results for review every single day. Now, not each and every one of those is a new case of COVID-19. Some of those are among individuals who have been retested, and sometimes we receive duplicate reports. For example, a laboratory may send us a report as well as a healthcare provider. So we have to go through and do what's called deduplication of a lot of these, but they still require a significant amount of effort. They're also indicative of overall the number of individuals who are testing positive. Again, in the past seven days, we re we've received an average of 370 or 369 positive COVID-19 results every single day. In the prior seven day period, the average number of test reports we received per day that were positive was 272. So just in the last seven days, as compared to the prior seven days, we have experienced a 36% increase in the number of positive test reports that Maine CDC received. Sadly, based on the experience that we have seen in other states, we anticipate this growth to continue. So with that, I would like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media for questions today. Again, Commissioner Lambrew and I are happy to take any questions we've got. And the first question for the afternoon goes to Steve Missler. Uh, thank you. I have three questions, but I think two of them are very quick. And then the last one might be a little more, um, re require a longer response. Um, the first one is about hospitalizations. As you know, Dr. Shaw, um, you know, we, I think we've increased our hospitalization, current hospitalizations by eightfold since a month ago. And I guess I'm wondering what the tipping point is 
for the CDC to consider um, auxiliary hospitals, field hospitals, that sort of thing. Just an idea of like where you guys land on that. Second question, and I'm just going to give them to you all at once if that's okay. Is sure. About, Steve. Is, a, is, a, is related to an announcement that you made last week about um, contact tracing and, and um, not contact, not staying with somebody beyond that initial contact. I'm wondering what that does to the uh, the recovery number. Does that make it less reliable as you're reposting recoveries every day? And then the final question is about um, vaccine distribution. I think there was a story that just moved that said that the Trump administration is ba basically leaving it to the states to pri prioritize vaccine distribution. And I guess I'm just wondering where you might differ with the Federalist CDC, which may provide some outlines um, on what their recommendations may be. I don't even know if they've settled on those quite yet, but um, hopefully, if that's, if that's too much, let me know and I'll... <laughs> Uh, we'll, 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 we'll go through all of those, Steve. Let me first start with the recovered question. Uh, you are right. Um, as a result of contacting individuals once, we don't always have insight into whether they have met their recovered period. We still do receive reports on recoveds, uh, but their number, as you say, is not does not have the same reliability uh, as it did before. For reference, the number as of right now is 9,098. But again, because we are contacting individuals once and going through the entire process of providing public health guidance on that first call, gathering who their contacts were, understanding where they have been, but not necessarily following up with them in the middle or at the end of their period, the, the number of individuals who we know to have been recovered is underestimated by the current number. So yes, that, that is unfortunately uh, a move that we've had to make, as well as a move that a number of other states have had to make. Uh, as for the auxiliary hospital, uh, I'll turn that one over to Commissioner Wambrew, and then I'll pick it up on the end on the vaccine side. Yeah, so there is no single number that will trigger our setting up of alternative care sites. We do have plans for those sites. We are dusting off those plans and making sure that they are viable in the current environment. But that depends on number one, where is the regional increase in inpatient COVID-19 cases and how do we maximize regional resources? Two, are there other beds in facilities that we can be using because beds and facilities far exceed the type of setting that we would set up in a civic center or other auditorium? And third, we're looking hard at treatment options because we continue to see an expanding access to different treatment options to help prevent people, people's COVID-19 course from getting so severe that they need a ventilator, for example. So all those factors play in, as well as staffing. One thing we've heard loud and clear is we had to really work hard, not just on the beds and the ventilators, but on the people who care for them. So that is rapidly evolving as we begin to look at what are our available resources throughout the state of Maine. So there is no one answer. We are working hard on it. and we. We will be prepared if we need to. I would say as a side note, we'll release a press release today, but we do expect to start offering tomorrow a new financial relief opportunity for healthcare organizations like hospitals that have not been previously eligible for coronavirus relief funds. This includes hospitals and nursing facilities of any size, as well as behavioral health and community-based organizations with more than 250 employees. This program will be modeled on the Maine Economic Recovery Grant Program and provide up to $100,000 in financial relief for these healthcare organizations. And we feel strongly this will help Maine's healthcare providers who have risen to the challenge continue to be able to provide services throughout this pandemic. We look forward to announcing that later today. And we thank our colleagues at hospitals, health systems, and community-based organizations throughout the state of Maine for all they're doing to keep our residents safe. And Steve, on the vaccine distribution front, here's where things stand. Uh, it, it is the case that the Trump administration has given states a very high degree of discretion with respect to how they move vaccine within the states, as well as with respect to who within states may receive that vaccine first. But we're not making these decisions on our own or in isolation. Indeed, tomorrow, the US CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, a group called ASIP, is going to be meeting to take votes on advice and recommendations 
officially to the US CDC, but unofficially to the states on how those allocation decisions should be made. They've put out a draft framework that prioritizes, for example, frontline healthcare workers, residents of long-term care facilities, and what I think is an important inclusion, individuals who are involved with critical parts of state, infra state overall infrastructure. This includes everyone from uh, frontline uh, uh, law enforcement personnel to the folks who manufacture and move our food from one place to another. So that, me that group is meeting tomorrow, Steve. Um, I'll be, I'll be attending part of that meeting as well. And after they have taken their official votes, um, we'll wait and see and then analyze where, what they recommend and then how that matches up to how we can accomplish things in Maine. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn things now over to Evan Pop at the Maine Beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the last question about um, hospitalization capacity. And um, Commissioner Lambert, you had mentioned um, something about um, concerns around staffing if, if um, hospitals were to um, have an increasing number of COVID patients. I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. And um, you know, is, there, is that something that the state is, is cur currently concerned about and um, you know, what would be done to, to help prevent that? Sure. So even before COVID-19 hit the state of Maine, we've struggled with ensuring we have sufficient nursing and physician and other types of staffing for our healthcare facilities in Maine. We've been working on that. We have a dedicated team here at our department that works night and day to figure out how do we ensure that we have sufficient staff to make sure our residents' needs are met. In the early days of COVID-19, when many people were deferring elective or non-urgent health care, we did have some surplus staff that could more readily staff some of these alternative care sites. Now, where we have most of our health care services open in the state of Maine, that spare staff that we might have had in April, May, or June is now working. In addition, in addition with community spread, we are having some of our health care workers affected by COVID-19 as well. So with all that in mind, we are looking hard at, number one, how do we support our facilities to care for people in intensive care units, in hospital beds, which is where the highest quality care can be provided. Two, are there other staffing models that we can look at? Looking at different levels of types of professionals who could be in those sites. Looking at whether we can redeploy staff from one part of the health system to those sites. So we are looking at all options to make sure that if we need an alternative care site, we'll be able to staff it. And this might be the, the same answer as, you know, if there's a um, tipping point for hospital beds, but is there um, sort of a, a number of people in the hospital that would make it difficult to have enough staff to care for those people? Again, each hospital has their own staffing plan. We look at the overall numbers. We track on a hospital specific basis what's going on. We are in regular communication with the hospitals multiple times a week to make sure that we're cited on what's going on. So we at this moment are not at a point where we need to worry about alternative care, care sites. That said, we will be, pre be prepared should we need to do so. Thank you. Um, and then this next question um, could be for, for either one of you. Um, so we've noticed that some misinformation about COVID is pretty prevalent on several um, popular main talk radio programs, um, including powerful voices like former Governor LePage um, and some members of Republican state leadership um, saying things that deaths continue to drop and mask requirements are totalitarian. Um, are you aware of this type of misinformation being spread on some of these radio programs? Um, and what would be the state's approach to making sure that those who listen to such programs are reached by uh, COVID information that's backed by science. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll start there um, and, and invite Commissioner Lambrou to, to follow on. Mis misinformation um, has been unfortunately a staple of COVID-19 as it has been during many other emergencies. Uh, unfortunately, the two seem to be frequent travelers. And there are many reasons why misinformation persists. Often it's driven by fear uh, often it's driven by not having all the facts. Uh, I'm not aware of the specific examples that you noted, but I'm certainly aware that in the national media and even in the international conversations, there are folks that have the facts and then there are folks that don't have the facts. 
I think my view, uh, Evan, is that the best way to make sure that misinformation is the minority voice is to equip everyone else out there with the facts. That's one reason why these media briefings are something that we have continued. I think this is maybe the 140th or so. Uh, we can get the exact number. But my view is that one of the best ways to ensure that misinformation doesn't become the prevailing form of information is to make sure that on a daily, consistent basis, everybody out there knows what the scientific facts are and they hear it from folks who are getting it from other experts. That's one of our goals during these briefings. And I can't comment specifically on the points that you raised, but for me, the best way to combat misinformation is with true and correct information. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Jennifer Osborne at the Ellsworth American. Hi, thank you. How long on average does it take a nursing home or a facility like a nursing home to get an all clear after an outbreak, specifically in a situation like Island Nursing Home where more than half of the residents have been affected? Mm -hmm. So in order to close an outbreak investigation, which Jennifer is implicitly the question that you're asking, when is an outbreak over? When do we designate that it has ended? Uh, there are a number of criteria that need to be met, but principal among them is that they need to have gone at least a full incubation period. That is to say 14 days with no new cases among either residents or staff or contractors who may be spending time there. Uh, that involves, of course, doing serial rounds of testing. Iowa Nursing Home, for example, will be doing its next round of testing the day after tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, and they'll be testing individuals who were not yet tested or not tested positive yet. If we detect additional cases, then the clock gets reset. But after they can go a full incubation period with no new evidence of transmission, that's when we start considering the outbreak to have been past its worst days. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn things over to Bob Evans at News Center next. Good afternoon. Um, over the weekend, a group of medical activists put up an anti-vaccine banner to spread a message about the COVID-19 vaccination, stating COVID-19 va vaccine manufacturers are exempt from liability. What do you know about that? And should people be concerned over the vaccine manufacturer's non-liability factor. Yeah, uh, Bob, uh, I'm not familiar with the banner that, that you noted, uh, although I am familiar with that line of argumentation. I, I, it would take, um, I won't go into all of it here, but the, the bottom line is that many, many years ago, the US Congress created a national compensation system for anyone who may have been injured by a vaccine. And it creates, um, I don't want to go into the lingo, but it creates an automatic system whereby folks who can demonstrate that they have been potentially harmed by a vaccine can receive an automatic payout. This does not relieve the manufacturers of the liability. It just centralizes it in the form of a government program that's run by the federal government. So I won't go into all of that here, obviously, but there is much written about this, uh, and it's, it's a, a very well-publicized and well uh, made aware government program that's been in place now for a number of decades. Okay, um, and along the same lines, some doctors say the CDC should warn people about potential side effects from the COVID vaccine, saying it won't be a walk in the park. What do you know about uh, any potential side effects from the vaccine? Have you heard anything? Sure, well, let's, be, let's start at the top here, Bob. Any type of medication, be it a vaccine or an antibiotic or anything that you may take has the potential for side effects. Vaccines are no different in that regard. Based on the data that the vaccine manufacturers have put out and are submitting to the US FDA, as well as preparing for official publication, there, there have been some quote side effects, namely a little bit of pain at the site of injection, as well as potentially feeling a little under the weather in the, in the 24 hours afterwards. Now those aren't side effects, those are effects. A needle going into your arm is expected to generate a little bit of pain. And vaccines work by stimulating an immune response in the body. That immune response may make you feel crummy for a day or so, 
but that's not what we think of as a side effect, that is an effect. But to be sure, we need to wait until all the data are in and the US FDA, as well as the medical and scientific community have had a chance to vet it. We can't say right now today what all of that will look like. That's all the more reason why the US FDA is analyzing those data, preparing their own independent analyses that are being done by career scientists at the FDA who specialize in analyzing the safety and efficacy of vaccines. I personally am waiting for those reports as well as the companion reports by the US CDC because that'll really inform our judgment. Great. Um, can I just get a clarification on something you said earlier too? Um, sure. Including info from last week, it seems like a significant number of deaths uh, have come from Somerset County. Are these folks related to a specific outbreak or just a combination? Um, it's actually not anything in specific. Um, I'll, I'll go back and confirm that. I'll take a look to make sure that that's the case. But we too have actually, I, I, we too have noticed that same trend and we have not pinpointed it. Um, it. It does not appear to be associated with a specific nursing facility or anything of that nature. We'll check with one of our epidemiologists uh, to make sure that that understanding still holds, but we too have noticed that trend as well. Okay, thank you so much. And, and Bob, just one, one last thing on the vaccine point on the first question. The name of that federal program for reference is the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Um, it, again, it is a well-publicized, well-known program that centralizes any claims for harms that may have been resulting from vaccines. Awesome, I'll check it out, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Steve Porter at Seacoast. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, my first question is about the latest timeline in Maine's vaccine rollout plans. I know that this is something you've commented on before, but I'm, I'm hoping to get the latest info. If a COVID-19 vaccine is approved for distribution with where we stand today, are you ready to begin distribution by mid-December? And how many doses do you expect to receive for that very first group of high priority recipients, phase 1A? Sure. Um, so uh, Steve, let, let me take the latter question first. I, I I'll give you the numbers, but before I do, and then after I do, I want to emphasize how preliminary and changing these numbers are. They can change. We have been told they may change. Indeed, they likely will change. But that being said, what we have been told is that Maine will receive approximately 12,000 doses. That's not patients, but 12,000 doses, sufficient for roughly 6,000 individuals of the Pfizer vaccine. We, have, we are still waiting to hear what our allotment of the Moderna vaccine will be. I'm gonna say it again though, that number we have, it has been stressed to us is preliminary and very much subject to change based on the final numbers of vaccines that are manufactured. Again, vaccines are being manufactured in parallel as the approval process is undergoing. And thus, when that authorization occurs, if it occurs, that will be the date at, upon which the final determinations of allocation will be made. So I just wanna triple stress, that is a preliminary number. Now, in terms of our distribution timeline, uh, Depending on when the vaccine starts shipping after any potential authorization, that will govern how we get it out to healthcare facilities. Those first doses will be focused on healthcare providers. Uh, and that is consistent with the National Academy of Science, as well as the proposal that the US CDC's advisory committee will be discussing tomorrow. So right now, our focus is on making sure we can provide that Pfizer vaccine to healthcare facilities that have the ultra cold storage units in place so that they can start organizing to, to deliver the vaccine. We've been working with those facilities to make sure they are planning on administering it, but once we receive word, they'll have to shift those plans into action. The same thing on our end. Some of that vaccine will come to our central warehouse so we can work with hospitals that don't have that central storage capacity with the ultra cold so we can push it out. Our hope is to do that as quickly as possible. Now, this vaccine, especially the Pfizer one, comes with very unique and specific handling requirements. It can only survive outside of an ultra cold environment for a certain number of hours. So we are shoring up our logistics. Our goal is to be able to vaccinate 
both with velocity and equity as soon as the vaccine is released. A follow-up question about that. If I'm understanding the interim draft plan that was released last month, um, there are something like 19,900 high priority healthcare workers associated with Maine hospitals. If, if you only have enough of the Pfizer vaccine for 6,000 patients, how will you determine which one third of, of those high priority healthcare workers will get it first? The advice that we have provided to healthcare facilities in Maine is to calibrate their administration based on the risk of exposure of those healthcare workers. All healthcare workers are vitally important to our healthcare ecosystem, but some have a higher risk of day-to-day -day exposure to COVID-19. Those are the healthcare workers that we have recommended the healthcare facilities that they spend time now identifying and making plans to vaccinate first. The other thing, Steve, I, I just, I wanna emphasize that number I provided earlier of the initial dose is preliminary. The other thing that we have asked for is not just what the initial dose size might be, but what the frequency of doses may be. So we are still awaiting information about whether we will receive X thousand every week, every month, every six weeks, so on and so forth. We haven't received that information yet, but it's possible that we will receive multiple more frequent, but smaller shipments rather than one larger, less frequent shipment. We're still hoping for clarity on that from the US CDC and Operation Warp Speed. Understood. One final follow-up, if I may. It's, it sounds like you're saying um, within the guidance that you and the US CDC are providing, the individual healthcare organizations will determine which persons on their teams are the highest priority and to get the very first available vaccine. Is that correct? It will be a conversation. What we have offered to them is to help them provide them with technical assistance on doing that identification. But our recommendation will be that within the scope of sort of what's called phase 1A, the very, very first initial allotment focused on healthcare providers, within phase 1A, we have asked for their assistance in identifying who within their workforces has the highest risk of exposure. They've simply got better information on exactly who those folks are. We can provide the principles for example, we can provide them the data that suggests that certain categories of healthcare workers are at higher risk of exposure, but actually identifying those individuals within their system, knowing who they are, knowing what their shifts are, and arranging for them to be vaccinated, that's something that we're working with the healthcare systems and asking them to help out as part of their planning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn over to Brian Sullivan at WABI next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, question for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, Commissioner, we receive messages daily from viewers about locations that perhaps aren't uh, strictly enforcing face covering requirements. And we've asked some of these businesses that we've heard about about that. And they say that they actually fear the reaction that their employees might get when confronting a customer who's not wearing a face covering. Uh, what advice would you give to people in these situations and who is charged with the enforcement of these requirements? Sure. To start out with, we tried to clarify the responsibilities and the rules associated with face coverings in public settings in a memo issued by Attorney General Fry and myself last week. We also have posted information and tools on our website, including videos for people about how to de-escalate when there is a confrontation associated with face coverings or other public health guidance. We will always continue to provide information, tools, and support as we try to keep people safe. Because as a reminder, this is about common sense. This is about science. This is about trying to continue to allow Maine people to go shopping, to engage safely, and face coverings are a key part of that. When it comes to our policies, we do for a subset of organizations, large retail, for example, municipal buildings, we ask them to enforce the requirement about face coverings. That can include denying entry. We will continue to work with organizations to give them, again, the tools on how to do that, also how to provide an alternative way of service for people who otherwise can't wear a face covering due to a disability. But it's a mix of responsibilities between the state, different regulatory agencies, and certain large establishments. And we're always looking for better ideas about how we can support all those actors out there trying to do the right thing and keep people safe. 
So the advice that you would give to a, a person who finds themselves in that situation would be what? That we do have training on how to approach people who are not wearing a face covering. We do have alternatives such as suggesting that somebody wears a face shield. We have tools and you know, tools, education and resources for all those people on the front lines. And we urge them to look at those resources, to work with their employers, to work with all of our different state actors as needed to give them the tools to help keep people safe. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Shaw, uh, viewers, again, are, I've given us a few messages about um, things that may be happening in the town of Newport. I didn't know if you could give us any insight into cases that may have sprung up at the town office or with some uh, local uh, or town employees. Um, is there any information you could provide there? Uh, Brian, I'm not aware of the the, the cases you mentioned uh, associated with the town office, uh, but I, we did just open an outbreak investigation in recent days into the Nokomis Regional High School in Newport. Uh, you know, I think there, Brian, the, the key is that, first of all, the virus is everywhere around us. Small towns, big towns, rural parts, urban parts of the state, you name it, the virus is everywhere. And what we are seeing is that a virus in certain parts of the state, in certain towns, say Newport, can unfortunately precipitate outbreaks in places like schools. The best thing for folks to do at this point is to assume that the virus is everywhere around them. Indeed, that's the advice and the recommendation that Maine CDC has issued way back, going back to March and April, that it's more true today than it ever has been. There's not a corner of the state that doesn't have cases or doesn't have the possibility of exposure. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Uh, gonna go over to Charlie at the BDN next. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, uh, my first question is about, uh, it's about facilities that have had more than one COVID outbreak. I, I know there are a, a few nursing homes that, that or long-term care centers that fall into that category. And um, I guess part A of the question is, are, do you know of any other types of facilities that have seen that? Like, for example, I seem to recall maybe one of the paper mills did, but then just more generally, do you have any kind of thoughts about, um, you know, are facilities that have had these better, that have had one outbreak better equipped to handle a second or, or somehow less well equipped? Or, or do you have any other general thoughts about these situations? Uh, sure thing, Charlie. You're correct on the paper mill. ND paper did have a second wave, which uh, we, we open outbreaks, we reopen outbreak investigations. If, to Jennifer's earlier question, they've gone past the threshold number of days, but then new cases pop up, we reopen the outbreak investigation. So ND paper is one such example. But as you also noted with respect to long-term care facilities, we've had a few that have had numer uh, more than one outbreak, Jurgen Pines, as well as a few others. Um, I think what we've observed is, is, is to be sure outbreaks are challenging, whether it's the first time or whether it's a repeat occurrence. But we have observed that, for example, in our work with Durgan Pines, they were more aware of the cadence of what needs to happen, what happens next, what the next steps are. And so that allows for both us as well as them to do more advanced planning on day one, anticipating, for example, how many testing supplies would be needed, how the increase of an outbreak will change the demands for PPE. But make no mistake, no matter if it's the first time or the second, third, or what have you, the challenges that they pose are equally difficult, but our ability to see around the corners is what changes. Okay. Um, and uh, with um, the, so my other question is about uh, testing for COVID-19. Do you think, it, you know, there's been some reporting by some of my, you know, other news outlets in Maine that there have been delays in scheduling testing at uh, state and private sites around, you know, in recent weeks. And um, do you think that there are too many people who are getting tested under the state's standing order uh, to get tested without a doctor's order? And then um, is there any way that the state, if that's so, would consider, you know, adjusting the standing order somehow? You know, um, Charlie, that's a question that we've, we've 
talked about internally, a variation on that question, which is, are the right people getting tested? Uh, it's, which is kind of a variation on the, the question that you noted. Uh, we, we've started to look at some of the data around that. And with the exception of a couple of very rare examples, we haven't found systematic evidence to suggest that the wrong people or the, you know, we haven't found evidence one way or the other. We know that people are getting tested. And in an era of community transmission, which is what we have in Maine, the main goal is to make sure that folks have access. Um, we haven't discussed making any retractions or pulling back the, uh, the standing order, which allows anybody in Maine to get a test irrespective of symptoms or what have you. We haven't had serious discussions about pulling that back. Uh, I don't want to rule that out, but it's not something that's on the table right now. Okay, thank you. I will just add that we are trying to make sure okay. people know, though, that a test is nothing more than a snapshot. It is not a free pass to be able to go to a large gathering, engage with people thinking that you're not COVID free. So we are going to step up our education effort because we do want to make sure that when people do get tests, they know what it means. And, and this is more for folks who are watching, um, maybe not directly in connection with your question, Charlie, but for folks who are watching, one thing we have seen uh, is for example, uh, folks wanting to get tested multiple times. And the bottom line here, according to the scientists at the US CDC, is that if you've tested positive, there's not a need to be retested for at least 90 days. And so if you've tested positive for COVID-19, uh, we will work with you and there is information on our website for what you should start to do ASAP, but getting retested is not among those things. Uh, I'm gonna turn things over to Amy Brown next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I have a couple of questions from listeners, but just quickly uh, following up on the question about side effects from the vaccine, any potential side effects from the vaccine. Have the companies yet disclosed how many people dropped out of their trials because of uh, discomfort because of the vaccine shots? Um, Amy, it's possible they have. I, I, I haven't I haven't reviewed those data to that to answer that specific question. So I can't tell you whether the companies have disclosed it or have not yet published it. Certainly, it would be reported to the US FDA as part of the application for an emergency use authorization. And certainly it would be in the publications uh, in the way that scientific studies are done. Number of individuals who don't complete a trial is always a factor. I don't know whether they've reported it in the data they've released thus far. It's possible they have, but I, I'm, not, I can't, I'm not the primary source on that one. Okay, thanks. I haven't heard anything about that. Um, and listeners, one is wondering about the uh, 15 minutes of cumulative exposure guideline, if you can explain if that means over a period of what length of time? Is that just in one day or over several days or how does that work? It's over a 24 hour period. Okay. And the other one is uh, people have been seeing reports about vitamin D levels that people who have lower levels of vitamin D uh, seem to have a uh, harder time if they do get COVID or possibly maybe more susceptible possibly related to their immune system. Have you been following the reports about vitamin D and do you have any thoughts about them? I've been following that literature very closely. And in the history of modern medicine, there's a time in the history of every new disease, be it an infectious disease or another disease where folks wonder whether vitamin D could be the culprit or the, the cure. Um, with respect to COVID-19, the data are not all in yet. I know it sounds alluring. What could be easier than popping a vitamin D pill to protect yourself from COVID. But this is one of those situations where we have to keep a skeptical eye. All too often in the history of vitamin D and some condition, simple solutions are usually neither. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna turn things over to Steve at WMTW. All right, thank you very much. Uh, just back to uh, the testing uh, for a second. Uh, with so much this past weekend, travel, shopping, so much interaction, uh, do you fear an onslaught of testing and do we have the capability to, to handle it all? You know, um, Steve, I'll, I'll start and then welcome Commissioner Wambrew's analysis as well. Um, I, I, my, 
So we certainly had an increase in testing and demand for testing in the run-up to Thanksgiving. Um, as the commissioner noted, even a negative test is not a passport. Uh, it still leaves open the possibility that individuals could have been positive and just not yet tested positive. Now, here we are in the aftermath of Thanksgiving and then starting to prepare for another round of holidays. The possibility that there will be an increased demand for testing from individuals who may have decided to gather with their families, who may have been traveling and need a negative test in order to re be released from isolation having returned to Maine. It's a possibility. Uh, we've been working with the swab and send sites as well as with Walgreens to make sure that they've got the supplies they need as well as with our laboratory to make sure it can accommodate samples. But there is the possibility of an increased demand. Yep, and that support that we're providing includes both considering increasing the amount that we're paying to swab and sends that can expand its capacity, as well as bringing on more staff here at the state to make sure our lab can really meet the demand that is coming to it. So we are always looking to expand our capacity and to improve access, especially as we go into this month. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald next. Yes, hi, thanks for taking our questions. Um, I know Thanksgiving uh, just ended last week and the travel season, Thanksgiving travel season just ended and we don't have a lot of data points yet. Uh, we did hear from the main turnpike that um, uh, travel on the roads on the turnpike was one third less than previous years. Um, is that encouraging at all or, or not enough? Or uh, is there any, or, or do we have to wait for more data to come in? Do you have any thoughts about Thanksgiving travel and gatherings? And I have so a follow the, up to you, thank you. Yeah, the, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, given that Thanksgiving this year, of course, was on the 26th, generally speaking, it takes about 12, maybe even up to 14 days after a particular event, or in this case, a series of small events for any transmission that may have occurred to be fully detected because folks have to start getting sick. That takes five to seven days. Then they have to arrange for testing. The test result has to come back. It has to be reported to Maine CDC and then investigated. So that process, not just in Maine, but nationwide, really takes about 10, 12, maybe even up to 14 days. So it's gonna be a little while before we know whether that 30% reduction uh, is how we can characterize that or how we should think about it. Okay, thanks. And my follow-up questions are for uh, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, the December 6 uh, expiration of the 9 p.m. curfew, are you uh, considering extending that, uh, considering that we don't know uh, what the effect of Thanksgiving holiday is yet? And then my other question is the way the, the virus rates are currently um, and outbreak rates currently, um, it, is there any discussion about uh, further delays to the high school football, uh, high school sports season, winter sports season, or do you think it'll still start December 14th, practices start December 14th? Yeah, so we always on a daily basis look at what our policies are, what seems to be working, what more we can be doing, and we are aggressively doing that, especially in light of the increased number of COVID-19 cases here in Maine. To the specific policies, I think we've heard from the different municipalities that the earlier closing time for restaurants and similar establishments seemed to have gone well. There weren't many complaints about that. We will assess whether we think that made a difference in terms of gatherings in the late evenings that could have caused COVID-19. We'll let you know by Thursday if that's gonna continue. We also are in active review of what's going on in different states on school sports. We'll be talking to different school officials to see what they are thinking and planning with regard to school sports. I will say we saw today that I think New Jersey is going to be pushing back some of the starts of its sport, fall sports, or excuse me, winter sports seasons. We know Connecticut has changed its policy, so we're looking actively at what goes on with fall sports. That's just one of the reviews that we do on a regular basis. But I will say that just going back to the evidence, the experience, we always look back to see do we have any evidence that the restrictions that we put in place have been effective before we continue them, as well as 
whether or not we think delaying the start of new activity is worthwhile. So we had no, no announcements today, but we're reviewing it all. And the final question of the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Thank you very much, Sasha Shaw. Um, earlier, you mentioned that the, the state of Maine is likely to continue trending in the same direction as the country at large in terms of, uh, of caseload, which is something uh, Dr. Fauci spoke to over the weekend. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, about uh, uh, this is kind of a broad question, but could you talk a little bit more about why Maine is, is likely headed in the same direction as the, as the rest of the country and if there are, are any kind of new steps that can be taken to, uh, to lighten the burden or anything else? Yep. Um, Patrick, um, I'll, I'll start by, you know, your, your question, I think, is, is an interesting one in counterposition to why Maine did not follow much of the other parts of the country over the summer. And so what has changed more recently that has put Maine in line, even though we are still performing well relative to other states, for example, positivity rate, although increasing in, in Maine, still stands two and a half times lower than the rest of the country, but why we continue to trend in an upward direction. And I think that's partly because of two driving factors. The first is that the fundamental transmission dynamics, the, the, the way the virus behaves um, right now, as compared to earlier in the outbreak, are just fundamentally different. Uh, right now, much of the transmission, though not all, is being driven by things like smaller gatherings. Earlier in the summer, it was being driven by larger, more focal events, events that tend to be occurring in larger cities, not something that occurs as much in Maine. So a lot of those differentiating factors. The other thing that has happened um, that has led Maine uh, on an upward trajectory similar to other states, but not with the same degree of intensity, to be sure, is that the levels of community transmission are just higher now. And in infectious diseases, where you start largely governs the trajectory that you follow. If you start at an extremely low, minuscule, low late rate, it's harder for exponential growth to take hold. But here, having started at a higher level of community transmission than the summer, as individuals started gathering more closely indoors, for example, that higher rate of community transmission coupled with more likelihood of transmission events being closer to people with less ventilation has led us on the unfortunate exponential growth trajectory that we're on right now. That's something that other states have followed. Again, we're still not experiencing the intensity of increases that other states have in the Great Plains and Upper Midwest, but our graphs are sadly um, going in the same slopes, but not with the same um, high points. Thank you very much. And I do wanna say going back to Joe's questions about other activities and other types of restrictions, we recognize the fact that every restriction comes with an impact. So today, Governor Mills announced a new program to support Maine's tourism, hospitality, and retail businesses backed by $40 million in federal CARES Act coronavirus relief funding. The tourism, hospitality, and retail recovery grant program is focused specifically on supporting main businesses such as restaurants, bars, tasting rooms, lodging, retail shops, and other small businesses that have been particularly hard hit by the COVID pandemic and face additional challenges with the coming winter months. As Governor Mill said, Maine's hospitality, tourism, and retail industries are a vital part of Maine's economy, supporting tens of thousands of jobs across the state. This program will provide some help for, for, and financial support to help these organizations sustain themselves through these difficult times. But along with governor, I continue to urge Congress to pass additional robust relief for Maine people and businesses. These, these restrictions, these public health measures come with an impact and we're very sensitive to it. We will do our best to use the resources within our control to support Maine businesses, but we do, do need more federal help. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Great. Well, thank you everyone for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us. As always, thanks to our colleagues in the media for kicking off the discussion. We hope everyone had a safe, 
and restful and socially and physically distanced Thanksgiving holiday. As always, we thank you for your time. We look forward to chatting with everyone again on Wednesday. In the meantime, please be kind, take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.